Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Today, we're going to be continuing our discussion in the Antichrist Showdown. This will be the third uh, and final section on the different translations. And the reason we're doing this one is, um, well, the whole thing was requested, but this one was also requested. Uh, so I wanted to take a look at it. Probably because out of all the various translations and the differences between the translations, this one might be, in a way, with the others as a foundation, the most important lesson of them all. And this, today we're going to talk about the King James Version, a little bit of history on it, fruits of it, and uh, exactly what, in, what went into that translation. And then we're going to look at the new King James Version today. Um, but before we begin, um, I wanted to share a wonderful Bible promise with you guys and just help to encourage people that are struggling right now with the things that are going on. This is from the, the Epistle of Jude, and then we'll have prayer after. It's from the Epistle of Jude, verse 24. It says, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. So a couple, couple things we learned from that verse. It's that we don't keep ourselves from falling. We, we actually help ourselves to fall, to fail. But Christ can keep us. He can keep us from failing. He can keep us from falling. The power that we have available to us is infinite. So our jobs, folks, our job is each and every day is to fill our hearts and our minds with the things that ennoble us, to wake up in the morning on our knees begging the Lord to help us die daily just as the Apostle Paul did, spending time with the Lord in devotion, doing his work, spreading the message, and, and pushing out the things that we know bring us down, whether it's music, movies and various forms of entertainment, various kinds of food and things like that. If it's bringing us down, if it's bringing us carnally down, when the temptations that we struggle with come, they're going to all but completely overborne us. So, but on the opposite is true too. When we are putting in the good things and when we are living our lives in submission to Christ each and every day, when the temptations come, we can go running to the throne of mercy and beg the Lord and ask the Lord to give us light, to give us strength, to give us power. Because the Lord doesn't despise any one of us. Many of us think that when we fail, the Lord is angry at us and that he is just waiting for us to fail so that he could say, well, you lost your salvation. Folks, that's a Catholic view. That's a Catholic view of salvation. Save today, lost tomorrow. That's not how it works. When you, when you choose to be a child of God, you become his son or his daughter. Now, when a son or a daughter makes a mistake or does something bad, does that make them not their son or daughter anymore? Absolutely not. That's why the Lord, it says the Lord chastises those whom he loves. He gives us a probationary time. And in that time, we are called to overcome. We are, we are called to perfection. We are called to not be saved in sin, but to be saved from sin. However, that doesn't mean that we're lost today and then saved tomorrow, lost today, saved tomorrow. That's not how it works. The Lord loves each and every one of us. And if we put our faith and confidence in him and trust him, he's going to do the work. He's going to help us to overcome. Our, our work is a choice. We have to choose him and let him work through us. So without further ado, let's have a word of prayer as we get started. Dear Father in heaven, Thank you so much, Lord, for your amazing love and patience with each and every one of us. 
please help us, Lord. We all have different things we struggle with. Some of them are actual sins. Others are things that are not necessarily bad for us, but that are keeping us from a relationship with you. Distractions, Lord. Help us. Help us, Lord, to remove these things from our lives. Help us to be like the, the folks that are in early writings that are with great anxiety seeking to overcome sin. Help us to not be careless and indifferent. And this morning, Lord, we pray that you'd give us discernment. Help us to understand what's going on with these different translations, in particular the King James versus the New King James Version in English. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so first let's start off with a warning. Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, page 411. It says, Satan has laid every measure possible that nothing shall come among us as a people to reprove and rebuke us and exhort us to put away our errors. There is a people who will bear the ark of God. Some will go out from among us who will bear the ark no longer. But these cannot make walls to obstruct the truth, for it will go onward and upward to the end. In the past, God has raised up men, and he still has men of opportunity waiting, prepared to do his bidding. Men will go through restrictions, which are only as walls daubed with untempered mortar. When God puts his spirit upon men, they will work. See, that's how it works. When God puts his spirit upon men, they will work. They will proclaim the word of the Lord. They will lift up their voice like a trumpet. The, Lord, the truth will not be diminished or lose its power in their hands. They will show the people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins. That's right, folks. That's part of our job. That's part of our job, to point out the sin in the camp, to point out the sin in the land. Many folks get upset with me, Paul, and Bill here at Truth Triumphant because they think, they think we're too hard on the conference. Well, folks, we, the apostasies that we have going on in the church right now are unbelievable. They are blatant betrayals of trust. They have to be dealt with. They have to be dealt with. This is what God's people will do. Ergo, if you don't do these things, I'll let you figure it out. They will show the people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins. That's our job. It goes on. It says, the conflict is to wax fiercer and fiercer. Satan will take the field and personate Christ. Satan himself will come to this planet. Well, he's already here, but he will come and he will, he will appear as Jesus Christ before our very eyes. Will we be ready for that deception? Paul, you want to add something? Yeah, going back to what you said a minute ago, we are on the borders of the promised land, literally. And as I shared with you earlier, secular analysts in the United States are saying they think they're going to see the beginnings of the scenes of the French Revolution in this country. Absolutely. Uh, and for those at Seventh-day Adventists who haven't read the great controversy or early writings or testimonies, that's exactly what the prophet says. So they talk about being, you shouldn't be hard on this and you shouldn't say that. Well, what do we do with uh, Phineas when on the borders of the promised land? Yeah, he dealt with the sin problem, didn't he? With a spear. And 25,000 died after that we are in serious dire straits it's not a matter of just wanting to challenge and to run it, it hurts i've been a seventh day Adventist all my life and what i see going on in the church is outrage independent and conference everything but present truth is what's happening and it, it's sad it's sad people yeah it's heartbreaking it's heartbreaking yeah. and how many people's lives did phineas save when he pushed that spear into those people. Hundreds of thousands. Right. It says the plague Literally, was stayed. hundreds of thousands, yes. Right. So that was a pretty harsh judgment, and that was a prince in it. That was a general conference officer that he did that to. Yeah. Amen. Amen. All right, so 
Keeping in mind with King James and New King James um, ap application as well here, the conflict is to wax fiercer and fiercer. It's not going to get easier. The things that we've seen in the last year and a half, it's just the start. It's going to keep getting worse and worse and worse. Satan will take the field and personate Christ. Now, what's going to be so dangerous about this? And this has everything to do with the New King James. What's going to be so dangerous about Satan appearing to be Christ? Most people will accept him, won't they? Yeah. Now, if Satan showed up in devil horns and a red suit and a pitchfork, how many people would follow him? Not that many. What if he showed up as uh, some gnarling beast of some kind, a dragon or something? No one would follow him. But that's not how Satan appears, does he? He shows up appearing like Christ. And let me tell you something. That has everything to do with the New King James Version of the Bible. Amen. Okay? Paul? Real quick. Again, spare to prophecy. Mrs. White says that the devil works. Lucifer works hard to make people believe he doesn't even exist. That's yeah. his goal as far as his own uh, uh, image. He doesn't right. even want... It, it's, a, it's a fairy tale. It's a cartoon. He doesn't even exist. Right. Let alone the dude in the red pajamas with the horns. Right. And Mrs. White also says that amongst the demons there are warlords. They war against one another. They, they have plots against, but one thing they're united on, one thing is to destroy Seventh-day Adventists and the Seventh-day Sabbath. That's yeah. what Lucifer is. That's their unity on. right there. Yes. Yeah. yes. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. So, and that's, that's what's so interesting, too, about Lucifer in heaven before the fall. He didn't show up to them, uh, to the angels that he deceived. He didn't show up to, and some of the ones that were almost deceived but weren't, he showed up to them as their great, charismatic leader covering cherub. They'd never heard a lie before. And here he is showing up, an angel of light, telling them all this stuff about God, and he had the closest relationship with God than any other angel. You see how dangerous it is? The reason why Lucifer is so successful is because he shows himself and appears to be a good being. And that's how he deceives people. And that has everything to do with the New King James. It goes on. Mrs. White says he will misrepresent, misapply, and pervert everything he possibly can to deceive, if possible, the very elect. You think he would attack the Word of God, maybe? Of course. Even in our day, there have been and will continue to be entire families who have once rejoiced in the truth, but who will, who will lose faith because of the calumnies and falsehoods brought to them in regard to those whom they have loved and with whom they have had sweet counsel. Don't trust anybody, folks. A deception could come from every, anywhere. Not me, not Paul, not Bill. Not Walter Vyth, not Doug Batch. Don't trust anybody. Check, vet everything that we say. Check it yourself. Read it yourself. Because then you get the understanding. Then you take the belief into the, the deep core of your soul. And then you can teach other people. You see, because there's going to be entire families that once rejoiced in the truth. But because somebody told them that the mark of the beast is the Holy Spirit issue... And they believe them because they had taught them everything else up until that point. They're going to be lost. That's just one example. She goes on. She says, they opened their hearts to the sowing of tares. The tares sprang up among the wheat. They strengthened. The crop of wheat became less and less. And the precious truth lost its power to them. For a time, a false zeal accompanied their new theories, which hardened their hearts against the advocates of truth as did the Jews against Christ. Very, very serious business, folks. Now, what about the New King James Version? At this point in the discussion, and these are just my words, it's just something I figured we'd point out. At this point in the discussion, we get to an interesting po uh, point. Folks can clearly see the problem with the Codex Vaticanus. It comes from Rome. Its proponents are historic enemies of true Christianity. It's got shortened or changed verses. Uh, which doesn't like. 
If it really is a fourth century manuscript, it is likely one of the copies of the corrupted Eusebius, ecumenical Bibles commissioned by Constantine. Folks can also see the glaring problems with the Sinaiticus. The origin story of how it was found is constantly changing. It was found in 1844 after the Millerite movement. It was heralded by pro-Catholic Protestants. It's got over 23,000 errors or corrections in it. It's from Alexandria, Alexandria, where the Gnostics were. And it was challenged by Constantine Simonides, something that was never dealt with. There's even more omissions and changes than in the Vaticanus. So people don't have any issue with uh, understanding and accepting that. Both these supposedly older and better codexes represent less than 10% of all the manuscripts found, while the King James Version is part of the family of Bibles, which represents 90% of all the Bibles known throughout the world. The majority text, received text, or textus receptus. Now, what about the new King James Version? Isn't that Bible only a modern translation of the King James and therefore a good Bible study, devotion, memorization, etc.? The King James has archaic language, and it's hard to understand, right? Well, before we even, before we even uh, move on from this point and go, and we're going to look at this. You know, when a translation is updated, like the King James, you have the, the King James 1611, right? And then in the, I think in the early 1700s, it was, it, was, uh, it was redone again. There was a few errors in there that were corrected. And... You had another one done in the 1770s. Now, the name of those Bibles are King James, King James, and King James. The name of this Bible, the new modern translation done that was finally revealed in, uh, or, or released in 1982, is called the New King James. Why is that? Why isn't it just called the King James? When you, when you update a translation... It keeps its name. However, when you change something, when you change something legally, copyright, for copyright reasons, when you change something and you do something differently, you have to call it by a different name. You can't call it the same name. So just throw that idea into your mind first. Now let's take a look at the shor a short history of the formation of the King James Version. This is from B.G. Wilkinson's book again, Our Authorized Bible Vindicated, page 49. It says, After the life and death struggles with Spain and hard-fought battle to save the English people from the Jesuit Bible of 1582, victorious Protestantism took stock of its situation and organized for the new era which, era which had evidently dawned. A thousand ministers, it is said, sent in a petition called the Millenary Petition to King James, who had now succeeded Elizabeth as sovereign. One author, and author describes the petition as follows, quote, the petition, carved, uh, the petition craved reformation of sundry abuses in the worship ministry, revenue, and discipline of the National Church. Talking about the Anglican Church, Church of England. Among other of their demands, Dr. Reynolds was the chief speaker in their behalf, requested that there might be a new translation of the Bible without note or comment. So this is after Elizabethan times. This is after the release of, uh, this is after the days of William Tyndale and the release of the English Bible. You had the Great Bible, Tyndale's New Testament. You had the Matthews Bible that was out there. You had the Bishop's Bible, and you had the Geneva Bible, which came out of Geneva. All from the Textus Receptus. The problem is that the translations, a lot of them, weren't really that good. They were good in some areas. Other areas, they, they were kind of confusing, right? You've got to remember that uh, the Greek and the Hebrew were superior languages to English. Like Greek, for instance, had nine different words uh, for the word love. They had all different kinds of variations of love. We just have the one, right? And that's why King James, um, in the love chapter of the Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, translates the word agape, which is brotherly love, as charity, because it means selflessness, right? So that it's trying to, that's what it's trying to pull to. But the word really does mean love. 
So it's a, there's a connection, there's an interplay between the two. And I think if you understand that, both of that, it's a, it's a much richer reading. However, that was some of the problems that they had. So they wanted to commission a modern translation of the Bible for that time that would take all of those problems into account. The problem with the Geneva Bible was that there was so much commentary in the Geneva Bible that it was basically like you were being taught by uh, the Calvinists. They had their doctrine, their theology in there. It wasn't just the scriptures. So you got to be careful with commentaries as well. Unlike Mrs. White's commentary, yeah. unlike Mrs. White's commentary, that's the Holy Spirit commenting on scripture. That's different. That's different than John Calvin pushing predestination in various areas of his Geneva Bible, okay? Or the immortality of the soul, which was another thing that... So the problem was they had this, this version of the Bible, the Bishop's Bible, which was really a poor translation, which the Church of England used. The Puritans used the Geneva Bible. The problem with the Geneva Bible was all the commentary. King James hated all the commentary. He actually was born and raised and, and taught the Bible. He's the son of Mary, Queen of Scots. Some say he was a, cla a, a closet Catholic. Uh, we don't really know that, but he was taught the Bible. And he did believe that the Bible should be in everybody's hands. And he didn't like the Bishop's Bible because it was an awful translation. And he hated the Geneva Bible because he believed in the divine right of kings. And over and over again, the commentary throughout the the Old and the New Testament, you would see John Calvin or Miles Coverdale or John Knox's comments that the kings are supposed to rule in the fear of God, that they are subject to God. So that they have, basically they have a responsibility to the people. They aren't above the people. So that's something that was being taught in the Geneva Bible. King James couldn't stand that. So... A bit about King James. Again, he believed in the divine right of kings. He was uh, the son of Mary, Queen of Scots. She remember she tried to. Uh, she was part of an assassination plot against Elizabeth. Again, some biographers say he was a closet Catholic. We don't know. He believed that he was the head of the church, and he did not believe in freedom of religion. This is why the Puritans, who were later called separatists as well. They left England because they were seeking religious freedom, and they eventually made them their way over to the United States. Okay, that's under King James. So he's, the Bible has his name, but that doesn't mean that he is a perfect person. All right. Now, he forced people to attend the Anglican Church and followed the agreed-upon practices of religion, the, the different prayer books. They were only allowed to pray what the prayer book said. They had a powerful clergy, and they had the church and the state together. He studied the Bible profusely as a young man, and he hated both the Bishop's Bible for, his errors, for its errors and the Geneva Bible for its commentaries. He wanted a Bible in a way, not exactly, but in a way like Constantine, he wanted a Bible that would unite the people. That's what he wanted. He wanted a Bible that the, both the Puritans and the Anglicans could agree upon. And those were the individuals that made up the work of translation. So, this is what happened. Again, in our authorized Bible Vindicated, page 54, it says, The 47 learned men appointed by King James to accomplish this important task, and there were Anglicans, and they were also Puritans as well, were divided first into three companies. One worked at Cambridge, another at Oxford, and the third at Westminster. Each of these companies, again, split up into two. Thus, there were six companies working on six allotted portions of the Hebrew and Greek Bibles. Each member of each company worked individually on his task, then brought to each member of his committee the work he had accomplished. The committee altogether went over that portion of the work translated. Thus, when one company had come together and had agreed upon what should stand, after having compared their work, as soon as they had completed any one of the sacred books, they sent it to each of the other companies to be critically reviewed. If a later company, upon reviewing the book, found anything doubtful or unsatisfactory, they noted such places with their reasons and sent it back to the company whence it came. 
If there should be a disagreement, the matter was finally arranged at a general meeting of the chief persons of all the companies at the end of the work. It can be seen by this method that each part of the work was carefully gone over at least 14 times. Every verse in the Bible was gone over 14 different times by different people and groups, both as a group and as individuals. So there was not like uh, a couple people at the top trying to control the whole group. No, people went back to their houses, translated it themselves, brought it, and then the whole group looked over it. Big difference than, in how the translations are done today. So there was gone over at least 14 times. He goes on, it was further understood that if there was any sp special difficulty or obscurity, all the learned men of the land could be called upon by letter for their judgment. And finally, each bishop kept the clergy, his diocese notified concerning the progress of the work. So if that anyone felt constrained to send any particular observation, he was notified to do so. In other words, the people of the land of England were, were constantly updated on which portion of scripture they were working on. That way, if somebody had an idea or something that they noted in scripture that they thought was important for the translators, they would send it to them they, so that they knew what this is not how any translation has ever been done, ever. Now the translations, like the 1880 revision, uh, that went on uh, over the course of 10 years. No one was notified of anything until it was released. This included every person in the land of England that if there was difficulty in understanding something, that they would be called upon to help. The amazing work. We don't really know how many minds worked on this together. So let's take a look at some of the archaic language, so-called. In the 1600s, they used the word thou. Thou is the subject of a sentence. Thou art lovely. We would say you today. Thee. We would also use the word you. But in the 1600s, it's the object of a sentence or a phrase. I gave it to thee. I gave it to thee, right? So actually, in a way, the superior language here is the older one. But then we have thy, your, possessive. So when the following word does not begin with a vowel sound, so it says, like, for instance, I am the Lord thy God. That's possessive. That means what God is telling us is that we are, he is possessed by us. He is our God. As much as we are his people, he is our God. Isn't that beautiful? Thine, your or yours. So something that belongs to you. Possessive again. So open thine eyes. Your eyes. Open thine eyes. Ye means you, the subject of a sentence or of a phrase. It means plural. You see, we have the word you for both plural and singular, right? So it's hard to understand whether or not someone is talking to a group of people sometimes. Context will dictate. Uh, or if someone is talking to just a single person. You don't have that problem in the King James because he'll, the, the word will be used ye. Ye means a group. Thou means you. Singular, plural. You can see the difference in the word. So you can see that actually some of the archaic language, if you just take a moment of which we just took, what, two minutes to look at some of these words and understand them, you'll see that it actually, it actually provides clarity with the scripture, uh, not confusion. Paul? Yeah, and God said, ye shall be my people and I shall be your God. So that's in perfect harmony. Right. And this is where the southern vernacular is, is, is more uh, sophisticated and more able to understand, because we got you all and all you all. So <laughs> when we want to be inclusive, <laughs> yeah. we have them. No, just yeah. But anyhow, <laughs> yes, uh, 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 you shall be my people and I shall be your God. Exactly. Amen. And that's why when you pray the name of Father, that denotes that, not this other foolishness, that denotes that. Absolutely. Amen. So, some sayings that we have, and then there's a lot. I just want to throw some out there just so you guys have a couple of gems. These are some sayings that we got in the English language 
secular included, throughout the entire world, and they come from the King James Bible. Here they are. The blind leading the blind. That's from Matthew 15. By the skin of your teeth. That's from Job 19. A broken heart. That's from Psalm 34. Can a leopard change his spots? That's from Jeremiah 13. A drop in the bucket. That's from Isaiah 40. Fly in the ointment. That's from Ecclesiastes 10. Go the extra mile. That's from Matthew 5. Nothing but skin and bones. That's from Job 19. The powers that be. That's from Romans 13. Put words in my mouth. That's from 2 Samuel chapter 14. Rise and shine. That's from Isaiah 60. The root of the matter. That's from Job 19. Let's see eye to eye. That's from Isaiah 52. And then signs, sign of the times. That's from Matthew 16. Now, there's probably 50, 60, 100 more that we could have gone through. But it's very interesting. This Bible, the King James Bible, actually elevated the language of the English-speaking peoples. So that's a very interesting note. And we still use the sayings that are specifically in the King James Bible themselves. If you go to the other translations, they don't read quite the same way. So the, the, the sayings, they come from the King James. Now, the results. Let's observe some of the fruits. The King James Bible, number one, helped to unite the English Protestants in theological understanding uh, of popery and resisting Rome. One individual named Faber, I don't know what his first name is, but he left the Angl Anglican Church for Catholicism. He was a clergyman. Uh, he's quoted in the English Bible, volume 2, page 158. This is what this, this uh, Protestant turned Catholic said about the King James. He said, who will say that the uncommon beauty and marvelous English of the Protestant Bible is not one of the greatest strongholds of heresy in this country? In other words, heresy to them, which is true, uh, true Christianity, kept the people from accepting Romanism. It was the King James Bible. Number two, it helped to dismantle the remaining elements of Romanism in the English-speaking world, point by point. The Reformation continued, and people began to grow more and more. Of course, there was some hindrances. King James himself was a hindrance. But that led to the pilgrims coming to the United States. Puritans, the pilgrims, came to the United States, uh, well, the New World, and founded the Plymouth Plantation there and started... Uh, what became political Protestantism and Republicanism later on it all started with them. And that's, that's one of the fruits of this Bible. This is the Bible of John Bunyan, who wrote Pilgrim's Progress. He spent 12 years in prison for his faith because he, w he refused to follow the prayer book. Amazing. Number four. This is the Bible of the Puritans. This is the Bible of Oliver Cromwell, the Pilgrims which included the Geneva Bible as well, who came to the New World. This is the Bible of John Wesley and the revivals in England and the establishment of Methodism. This is the Bible of Ellen White, Joseph Bates, Hiram Edson, James White, John Loughborough, William Miller, and the 1844 movements and the various biblical discoveries that came about after that. Understanding, again, the true state of the dead. Understanding the Sabbath and the sanctuary, and the law of God, and righteousness by faith, and health. All those things came from their fruits of the King James Bible. Now, we're going to look at the new King James. The work began in the 1970s, I believe it was 1975, and it was completed and released in 1982, the full Bible. Oddly, it was released as the new quote, King James Bible instead of the King James, because it was different than the King James from a legal copyright standpoint. The intent, according to the scholars, was to create an easier-to-understand Bible translation 
It was done by a 130 scholar team. They said this, I looked up on thomasnelsonbibles.com on the New King James or the New King James Project. They said, when the New King James Version was commissioned, the need to preserve the beauty and trustworthiness of the King James Version was imminent. However, language and dialectic barriers needed to be addressed. The New King James Version Bible translation is scrupulously faithful. A preservation of the authority and accuracy as well as rhythm and beauty with resounding clarity and understandability for today's readers. That's what they say. Now, we're going to test that right now. We're going to see if that's the case. So, the first big difference between the New King James and the King James Bible is the manuscripts they're based on. Oh, wait, I thought, I thought the New King James is just updating to modern English the King James. No, it's not. This is from uh, an article online, Ashley Evans, BibleReasons.com. The King James Bible translation was created in the 1600s. This translation completely excludes the Alexandrian manuscripts and solely relies on the Textus Receptus. Okay, so the King James uses the Textus Receptus alone, the one that we've already shown to be God's true word. The New King James. This translation includes the Alexandrian manuscripts. That's the Codex Sinaiticus. That's the Alexandrius. That's the Papyri 45 and all these other different error-corrupted translations, and probably the Codex Vaticanus as well, in order to find more direct information as to the meaning of the original words. This translation was created in order to reflect better readability. So, we have a problem here, don't we? The King James Bible uses the Word of God, the Textus Receptus, in its translation. The New King James uses the Codex Sinaiticus, ones that we've already shown to be corrupt and ones that Rome loves. So the New King James is using corrupted manuscripts along with the Textus Receptus. Would that enhance or debilitate the translation? I think the answer is very clear it would only bring the translation down by using corrupted manuscripts. It would never enhance it. Amazing book. This is by D.A. Waite. It's called Defending the King James Bible, page 156. It says this, The New King James Version. As mentioned above, the computer analysis of the New King James Version shows a total of over 2,000 examples of addition, <clears throat> subtraction, and change from the King James Bible and from the Hebrew in the Old Testament or Greek in the New Testament. In other words, it doesn't follow even the Greek and Hebrew that it's supposedly based upon. He says this, I believe the New King James Version is probably the most dangerous of the new versions of the present market today because it is the foot in the door and the camel's nose in the tent to lead eventually to an even more dynamic equivalency. By using the word King James Version in its title, it lowers people's guard. People think that it is very similar to the King James Version, using the same technique and so on. This causes people to think, well, this is simply a new King James and there's nothing wrong with it. There are lots of things deceptive concerning it. We give 13 examples where it, where it adds words. It changes nouns to pronouns 25 times. It omits the subjunct subjunctive mood, etc. The diabolical nature of the New King James Version shows itself in their printing all the various readings of the Greek text in the footnotes. In other words, they introduce doubt in the margin. This is how they do it. They print all sides and take their stand in favor of none of them. By so doing, they confuse the readers. The editors have made no decision as to what God's words really are. If that isn't confusing, you think about it. They claim to use the Textus Receptus as the basis for the translation, but it's not. And we already looked at that. So basically what they do is they take, they show people all the different translations of the Greek, right? In the, whether it's in the marginal notes or, or later on. 
and they take their stand with none. So if you give this to a brand new Christian and they're looking for, for the word of God, they don't find the word of God because they have all these different conflicting translations going on at the same time. And what does it do to a brand new Christian? It introduces doubt. They say, okay, so which one is it? This one's older. It has less in it. This one's newer. It has more in it. Which, which reading is the word of God? Now, all of a sudden, I gotta, either I got to go to my pastor or I got to go to the scholars or I just got to start, you know, deciding which passages of Scripture are the Word of God and which ones are not. Do you see the problem? So, let's take a look at some changes. I put up four different Bible translations up here just so we can take a look. I got the New King James and directly underneath it, I, this is my uh, Bible, that I, a Bible, a Bible I have at my house, the 1599 Geneva. They're both based on the Textus Receptus, the received text, the majority text. The NIV we've already looked at. So I'm putting that way over here onto the side, and I'm putting the New King James in the middle, and you tell me which one, uh, which one the New King James points to. The King James? or the corrupted NIV. So let's take a look. First, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. This is one of the ways in which we prove uh, the, that the immortality of the soul is false, right? Men don't have souls. They are souls, okay? Now, let's see if the new King James, as promised, would uh, clarify this, or if they make it more confusing. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Not a living soul, a living being. So, the whole, the whole argument that we make here, that, that Seventh-day Adventists make, in regard to the state of the dead... That whole argument is torn apart in the New King James because now it's living being instead of living soul. And if you're wondering which one it actually points to, the Geneva Bible says this, and the man was a living soul. They get it right too. King James, Geneva Bible, both based on the Textus Receptus alone, they got it. New King James, living being. What does the NIV say? Breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. That entire argument is gone. Poof, gone. Let's take a look at another one. Matthew chapter 6, verse 13. It says, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Geneva says the same thing. Deliver us from evil. New King James, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And then the NIV, of course, we've already looked at this one. They cut off most of it, but they also say deliver us from the evil one. Which one's more accurate, first of all? Do we need to be delivered from the evil one? Well, yes. But what about evil in general? Where does evil come from? Does it come from the devil alone? The Apostle Paul says, I know that in me dwelleth no good thing. Evils without can awaken evils within. We, we need the Lord to deliver us from ourselves as much as Satan, probably more than Satan. Because all he can do is tempt us to betray God. We have to make the decision to do it. It's the evil within us that's the problem. So which one's a more accurate translation? Deliver us from evil. That would include the devil, and that would include yourself. New King James? Nope, just the devil. And then NIV rips away his kingdom and says the evil one as well. But the point here I want to I prove more than anything. 
Who does the new King James align with? The corrupted NIV or the King James? The corrupted NIV. Another verse. Acts chapter 3, verse 26. Unto you first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you and turning away every one of you from his iniquities. And the new King James says, to you first God, having raised up his servant Jesus. Is Jesus the son of God or is he the servant of God? He's the son of God. They just demoted Jesus in the new King James. Sent him to bless you and turning away every one of you from your iniquities. NIV, what's it say? Servant. Get rid of Jesus there too, completely. Servant, servant, son. What's the Geneva say? God raised up his son, Jesus. So there's a demotion of the deity of Christ in the New King James. This one here, when Paul, Acts chapter 17, verse 22, is talking to the men of Athens, he says, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. So in a way, he's mocking their, their religious beliefs, right? He's saying they're too superstitious. They're too involved in some of this stuff. Now listen to the way it gets, it gets a little twisted here in the New King James. I perceive that in all things you are very religious. So now it sounds like a commendation. Right? He's approving of their pagan beliefs. NIV, this is what's most important, is that it agrees with the NIV. And it doesn't agree with the Geneva. All things ye are too superstitious. That's what Geneva says. Interesting. Now, Romans chapter 1, verse 25. King James, it says, Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Now notice what the New King James and the NIV do. They both say basically the same thing, so I'm just going to read the New King James. Who exchanged the truth of God for a lie is changing something and exchanging something the same thing. No. If I exchange something, that means I take something that I have and I trade it for something that I don't have. When I change something, in this case God's word or God's truth, I'm maliciously attacking God. I'm seeking to take his truth and warp it and twist it and say, no, it says this. I'm not exchanging it, I'm changing it. It totally changes the entire demeanor of the passage. Now, Geneva says this, which turned the truth of God into a lie. Same thing, turned, changed. And worshiped and served the creature. And they say, they go on to say, forsaking the creator, which is blessed forever. Amen. So it shows you more of the malicious intent there in the Geneva. Now, another one here, important. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. It says, but unto us which are saved, now let me read the whole thing, King James, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Geneva says the same thing, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. New King James, but unto us who are being saved, it is the power of God. More work to do. Sacraments. Whipping, whatever. Being saved, being saved, are saved. It's God's, God does it. Justification, sanctification, glorification. This, righteousness by works. Very interesting. Now, some other assaults. The word hell is removed in 2 Samuel 22.6, Job 11.8, 6, Psalm 16.10. I'm not going to go over them. They're all up there for you and replaces them with Hades. Paul, you want to add something? Oh, okay. Six minutes. <laughs> That's what I okay. <laughs> also, the word grave is removed in some places like this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 55. This is what the New King James says. O death, where is your sting? 
Oh, Hades, where is your victory? Is that more clear or less clear than grave? Less clear. The word repent is taken out 44 times. The New King James makes it much clearer by using the word relent or remorseful. Is relenting on something or being remorseful about something, is that quite the same thing as repenting? It's not. It's not. So Matthew chapter 21, verse 32, For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him, but tax collectors and harlots believed him. And when you saw it, you did not, at, you did not afterward relent and believe him. Folks, you don't need to relent in that situation. You need to repent. The term New Testament is not in the King James Version at all. These are the verses. The New King James replaces New Testament with New Covenant. And all these are in agreement with the modern translations, not with the Geneva, not with the other translations based on the received text. So, the word damned or damnation is not in the New King James. They make it much clearer, I'm being facetious there, by replacing it with condemn. And that agrees with the modern translations. They make things clearer by removing the word study from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, which again agrees with the modern translations. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God. It's, a, it's an order. It's, it's, a, it's a command. It's saying, study your Bible, you, yourself. Don't let other people do it. Study it yourself. Listen, listen how much doctrine can change just based off of this little change here. Instead of saying, study to show thyself approved, they say, be diligent to present yourself approved to God. What does that mean? Well, maybe that means that I have to go on pilgrimages. Maybe that means that I have to be one of these stigmatists that receive pain or whip myself, right? There's all different ways that you could be diligent to show yourself approved unto God. But that's not what it says. It says study to show yourself approved. It's an exhortation from the Lord for you to study your Bible. And they took that away. Is that more clear or less clear? It's a lot less clear because be diligent can literally mean whatever I want it to. Study is very specific. <laughs> the results, the fruits. The New King James Version, it has not united the English-speaking world like the King James did. It has had no revival movements of value that I was able to research or find. The world has plunged deeper into darkness with the acceptance of it. It does not help readers be grounded in the faith through study, but leaves them at the mercy of their pastors and priests to help them understand. Four, it does not dismantle Romanism, as, as the King James was a bulwark against Romanism that we saw, but it is aiding in the ecumenical movement. It's another ecumenical Bible. And folks, I've actually seen researchers call it the Bridge Bible. Because that's what it is. It's a bridge right back into Rome's arms. Ellen White would have rejected this Bible as she did the other translations. Well, we don't know that because she's not here, right? Well, I actually have one quote here and then we're going to close. This is from Councils to Parents, Teachers, and Students, page 22. Listen to what the Holy Spirit has to say. God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation, the apostle writes, through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. 2 Thessalonians 2.13. In this text, the two agencies in the work of salvation are revealed, the divine influence and the strong living faith of those who follow Christ. It is through the sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth that we become laborers together with God. Christ waits for the cooperation of his church. Listen carefully. He does not design to add a new element of efficiency to his word. He has done his great work in giving his inspiration to the word. The blood of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, divine word are ours. The object of all our provision of heaven is before us. Doesn't need to be changed is what she's saying. 
doesn't need to be more efficient. The great work God has, has commissioned in the past, it's done. The salvation of the souls for whom Christ died, it depends upon us to lay hold on the promises God has given and become laborers together with him. Divine and human agencies must cooperate in the work. Again, that's counsels to parents, teachers, and students, page 22. So folks, we're going to end where we started. The New King James may be, as D.A. Waite said, it may be the most diabolical and the most dangerous translation of them all. Because unlike the New International Version and the ESV and the other translations, which can easily be proved are based on the Codex Vaticanus and the Codex Sinaiticus, which are corrupt manuscripts, the New King James Version claims to be an updated King James. It claims to be in line with the Textus Receptus. And it has many of our favorite verses. But it's those minor changes which completely dethrone our doctrines, our beliefs. And sometimes they're hard to catch. That might be the reason why it is the most dangerous version. So I would, I would encourage you guys to continue to research this out if you don't understand more. And, and know your Bible. Because folks, if the Lord has given us a Bible and he's given us a Bible that is clear, why would we choose a Bible that is more confusing? It's a no-brainer, right? Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you so much, Lord, for your word. We thank you for your love and patience towards each and every one of us. Please help us, Lord, to understand. Please help us to take to heart these messages of warning through the spirit of prophecy and through the Bible. And help us to seek your pure truth, unadulterated, which we find in the received text, the majority text, but also in the King James Version. In Jesus' holy name, amen.